Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. Some locks are mass produced and entirely forgettable. Some are superbly engineered artefacts. And then there are those that are a part of history. As I've ventured deeper into my lock sport journey, I've become fascinated with locks that have a story to tell, and this is one of the first pieces of memorabilia that I've added to my collection. This is a D-clasp and lock, which was issued to active military as a way of securing the contents of their kit bag. The design has remained essentially unchanged for more than half a century, and has been used in both world wars across the globe. The curved neck of the clasp would be placed through the metal eyelets of the leather or canvas kit bag before being secured in place with a padlock. This design had the added benefit of providing a carrying handle for a better and more comfortable grip. These kits or duffel bags would then be shipped ahead of the troops to wherever their tour of duty might take them next. I've seen older versions of this same design in iron and more modern iterations are now cast in nickel. This lock is a warded design which has an even longer lineage, examples having been found in ancient China and Rome. They were particularly popular in the Middle Ages where warded locks were used in monasteries and churches to secure reliquies and other treasures. This one and the clasp are fashioned in brass and it was clearly manufactured in the US but there are no dates or maker's marks and where I have found images of similar locks online they've simply been labelled as vintage. Given the patina and style, I suspect that this unit was made at some point in the first half of the 20th century. Clasps and locks like this do come up on eBay and other auction houses and are popular among collectors, but it's more unusual to find one with its original key and in full working order. A warded lock consists of a series of obstructions, usually formed by blocks of stacked plates, which prevent the rotation of any key without a complementary pattern of notches. Only the bottom notch, however, is usually involved in affecting the open. This modern Brinks lock operates using the same warded mechanism, and as you can see, the warding aligns perfectly with the cut notches in the key. Here, I've taken a duplicate lock and having cut away the four retaining pins, you can see that it's made up of 17 stacked plates. After the top cover plate and second, which houses the spinning keyway, the next 12 are made up of two designs. The majority are open plates, allowing free movement of the key, but three of them, in positions 5, 10 and 13, have a narrower central channel, and these correspond to the cut notches on the key. Any key design which has a different arrangement of protrusions and notches will not turn in the keyway. Then at the bottom of the lock, we find two plates which together house the actuator, which is held under spring tension, locking the shackle in place. Then the final plate has an indentation which the tip of the key rests against to ensure that the teeth are correctly aligned. When the key is turned, the final tooth of the key interacts with the actuator, depressing the spring to release the shackle and achieve the open. In effect then, only the end of the key and the last three plates are active, while all the other notches and plates play a passive role. This design makes warded locks cheap to produce and there's little that can go wrong with this kind of mechanism, but they are vulnerable to at least two kinds of non-destructive attack. The first involves taking another key, ideally one made by the same manufacturer in the same range, and then grinding away all but the last notch. This skeleton key can now bypass the majority of the core, avoiding all those false protrusions while still interacting with the actuator at the bottom. If, however, you don't have access to a similar key, or don't have the tools needed to make a skeleton key, you can buy a set of warded lock picks instead. They typically come as a set and consist of a series of different shaped end pieces which mimic most warded lock designs and then it's just a case of trying each in turn until you find a match. So by no means a high security solution, but these locks didn't need to be. 
I suspect they functioned more as a way of preventing the kit bag from falling open in transit, rather than protecting the contents, which could of course have been accessed at any time using a knife or a bayonet to slice away the bottom canvas. I wonder who was issued this unit? What service did they give, and where and when? Did they get to go home to their family, hang up their uniform and live out the rest of their days in peace, or were they called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice? I suspect we'll never know, but if Locks could talk, I can only imagine what stories this one would tell. Thanks for joining me today, and until next time, take good care.